According to this theory, many common mythological elements are shared across India, Persia, Mesopotamia, and Europe. These similarities are commonly dismissed by mainstream academia despite the ever-mounting evidence of our common ancestry. Western academics all too often disregard the obvious cultural connections between the Sumerian, Egyptian, Indus Valley, and Asian civilizations. Instead of compartmentalizing each culture into a mutually exclusive analysis, the archive will endeavor to connect some dots between them. The focus of this presentation will be on the ancient Hindu civilization's connection to the Sumerian pantheon of gods known as the Anunnaki. The historical record is replete with accounts of extraterrestrial involvement in human development and evolution. They were reported by many ancient civilizations including the Sumerians, Egyptians, Greeks, Romans, Europeans, Mesoamericans, but the scriptures of the ancient Hindu civilization, during the time it was known as the Rama Empire, hold massive amounts of information about these beings who came to earth from the heavens. When comparing texts from the Vedic scriptures with the Mesopotamian cuneiform tablets, we can see a very strong similarity between the Sumerian gods and the Hindu gods. Personalities, behaviors, doctrines, passions, wars, technologies, architectures, and many events suggest the ancient Hindus were not talking about mythic creatures or fantasy deities, but real beings, superhumanoids coming from stars and their interaction with mankind. Perhaps the most fundamental link between the Anunnaki and the Indus Valley is the goddess Inanna, also known as Ishtar. As Zachariah Sitchin explains, one who had taken pity on, any liking to, Inanna was her great-grandfather Anu. It is known from Sumerian text that Inanna, who was born on earth, went up to heaven at least once, and it's also known that Anu had visited earth on several occasions. When and where exactly did Anu embrace Inanna as his Anunitum is not clear, but it was more than mere Sumerian gossip when texts hinted that the love between Anu and his great-granddaughter was more than platonic. Assured thus of sympathy at the highest level, Inanna raised the issue of a dominion, a land to rule over. But where? It is our suggestion that in their search for a land for Inanna, the Anunnaki decided to make the third region her dominion. Although it is generally held that the evidence for the Mesopotamian origins of the Indus civilization and for ongoing contacts between Sumer and the Indus Valley is limited to the few archaeological remains, we believe that there also exists textual evidence attesting to these links. Of particular interest is a long text named by scholars in Makar and the Lord of Arata, whose background is the rise to power of Uruk and of Inanna. Arata's geographical location, the capital of a land situated between mountain ranges and beyond Anshane, for example, beyond southeastern Iran, this is precisely where the Indus Valley lay, and the fact that it is a place renowned for its grain and bean storehouses, bear forceful similarities to the Indus civilization. Indeed, one must wonder whether Harappa or Arappa is not a present-day echo of the ancient Arata. Michael Tellinger elaborates, We read about twin cities that were erected by her and used for food storage among other things. Those must have been the cities of Harappa and Mohenjo-Daro. They were both built from the same bricks and in the same style and are the same age. According to the Sumerian tablets, they were built 860 years after the start of the earth year count. This could mean either 2940 BC or 6540 BC, depending on where we take the beginning of Earth time, either 7400 BC or 3800 BC, which would have been either one Shar or two Shar after the last visit of Anu. The Sumerian tablets go on to explain that Inanna was enticed by the prospect of residing in a grand temple at Sumer's city of Anu and became a commuting goddess. 
a working deity, so to speak, in faraway Arada, but a resident in metropolitan Eric. She did the commuting by flying from place to place in her boat of heaven. Her flying about gave rise to many depictions of her as an aeronaut, and the inference from some text is that she did her own piloting. On the other hand, like other major deities, she was assigned a pilot navigator for the more demanding flights. As the Vedas, which spoke of pilots of the gods, one Pushin guided Indra through the speckled clouds in the golden ship that travels in the air's mid-region, so did the early Sumerian texts refer to the Abgals, who ferried the gods across the heavens. Inanna's pilot navigator, we are told, was Nungal, and he was specifically named in regard to her transfer to the house of Anu in Erech. Inanna requested from Inki certain technical data in order to progress her region's development. However, she was unable to do so for various reasons. Ultimately, the result was that the third region of the Indus Valley did not develop as well as the other regions. This period also marked the onset of growing instability among the Anunnaki that would eventually lead to the end. So not only do we have Inanna intimately associated with the formation of the Indus civilization, we also have accounts of her flying from place to place in what is known in the region as Vimanas. And as a side note, the Archive is preparing an entire series on the Vimana for early next year. But for now, the crucial question regarding Inanna is who was her Hindu counterpart? One compelling possibility is the Hindu goddess Kali. Barbara Walker, in her comprehensive woman's encyclopedia of myths and secrets, contends. Western scholars erroneously viewed the various manifestations and incarnations of Kali as many different goddesses, particularly isolating those primitive Matrika Divas, mother goddesses, grouped together as Dravidian she-ogres. Yet, Kali's worshippers plainly stated that she had hundreds of divergent names, but they were all the same goddess. All were Kali Mahadevi, the great goddess. The same title she bore among Western pagans, Mother Earth, is said to be interchangeable with Venus. And of course, Venus is Inanna. The cuneiform tablets of Sumer display eight-pointed impressions to signify Inanna. Kali's magical diagram, or yantra, contains the eight-petaled lotus. Further, Inanna's powers as a goddess with her command of both the life-giving and life-taking aspects of the universe, in addition to the physical proximity of the Tigris and Euphrates rivers to the Indus Valley, tells us that Inanna and Kali are related not by coincidence. Kali is associated with Durga. Durga is Kali and Kali is Durga. Although worshipped in the two different forms, both Durga and Kali are representations of the same feminine Shakti. According to Hindu mythology, goddess Shakti or the feminine power was created by the culmination of energies of all the gods. In the later chapters of the Devi Mahatmayam, the story of two demons can be found who were destroyed by Kali. Chanda and Munda attack the goddess Durga. Durga responds with such anger that her face turns dark and Kali appears out of her forehead. Kali's appearance is black, gaunt, with sunken eyes, and wearing a tiger skin and a garland of human heads. In the Christian religion, we find the concept of the Holy Trinity. However, like many other concepts in the younger religions, the concept of a holy triad is much older than the Bible. The Trimurti, the sacred Hindu triad formed by Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva, is identical to the Sumerian Anunnaki triad of Anu, Inki, and Enlil. Brahma, the grandfather, is the god who rules from the sky. Vishnu is the creator, the preserver, the life engineer, and Shiva is the destroyer. As the fish avatar and lord of wisdom, Vishnu can be considered synonymous with Inki. And in fact, one of the incarnations of Vishnu, the Matsya or fish avatar, is identical to the Sumerian Inki. The legend of the Matsya avatar who alerted humankind of impending planetary deluge and chose one righteous man, 
Vevas Vatu Manu, the Hindu Noah, to construct a boat or ark and place within it representatives of the various species on earth to protect them from drowning is identical to the legend of Inki who saved humanity from the great flood by instructing Susudra, the Sumerian Noah, to build an ark and save himself and the world's animals and plants from destruction. Shiva seems to correlate best to Enlil. In Sanskrit literature, he's depicted as the one who is eternally pure, or the one who can never have any communication of the imperfection of the Rajas and Tamas. Enlil despised the crossbreeding between the Anunnaki and the humans. Shiva is the most feared god of Hindu cosmogony. He's the one that destroyed the three cities of the Asura demons that seemingly correspond to Sodom, Gomorrah, and possibly the Babel Tower. He's also the god that provided powerful weapons to other gods and warriors. Now, some of you may not agree with those correlations, and the Archive fully understands that a good argument is to be made that these correlations can be reversed. In other words, Enki could be Shiva and Enlil could be Vishnu. This is especially the case when analyzing Shiva's trident correlation to Enki. But it is not in the purview of this presentation to elaborate fully on these correlations. Even so, we can all probably agree that the Sumerian Enki and Enlil have compelling connections to the Hindu Trimurti. And when we acknowledge the possibility of reversing the correlations between just two deities, the archive would be remiss in not acknowledging that indeed the entire civilizations themselves can be reversed in correlation. In other words, the Indus Valley civilization could have initially influenced the Sumerians. Certainly, many Hindu scholars argue that very point. In May of 2016, archaeologists uncovered evidence that supports their argument. The Times of India reported that it may be time to rewrite history textbooks. Scientists have uncovered evidence that the Indus Valley civilization is at least 8,000 years old and not 5,500 years old, taking root well before the Egyptian and Mesopotamian civilizations. What's more, the researchers have found evidence of a pre-Harappan civilization that existed for at least 1,000 years before this. The discovery, published in the prestigious Nature Journal on May 25, 2016, may force a global rethink on the timelines of the so-called cradles of civilization. We have recovered perhaps the oldest pottery from the civilization. We used a technique called optically stimulated luminescence to date pottery shards of the early mature Harappan time to nearly 6,000 years ago and the cultural levels of pre-Harappan Hakra phase as far back as 8,000 years. The researchers believe that the Indus Valley civilization spread over a vast expanse of India. At the excavation sites, we saw preservation of all cultural levels right from the pre-Indus Valley civilization phase through what we have categorized as early Harappan to mature Harappan times. While the earlier phases were represented by pastoral and early village farming communities, the mature Harappan settlements were highly urbanized and organized cities and a much developed material and craft culture. They also had regular trade with Arabia and Mesopotamia. The late Harappan phase witnessed large-scale de-urbanization, drop in population, abandonment of established settlements, lack of basic amenities, violence, and even the disappearance of the Harappan script, the researchers say. So, in light of this discovery, the entire sequencing of civilization development will necessarily require reconsideration by mainstream academia, whether they like it or not. The Gobekli Tempe site is another notable example that forces reconsideration. And as more and more discoveries are made that push the dates back even further, hopefully the mainstream will abandon the current dating paradigm which makes little sense at this point. If and when this paradigm shift occurs, the Archive looks forward to a period where cultural bias and government funding are not the primary variables involved in determining the history of our timeline on Earth.